you can turn to Psalm chapter 8. This is where we're going to be uh, this morning. We're starting a new um, sermon series uh, today. It's a topical series, meaning we're going to be looking at more or less a topic which the Bible speaks to. Typically, we would do what's called an expository series where we're walking through a Bible passage by passage. But we're going to take um, just a couple month break and do this topical series to get a big picture, to get the guardrails uh, for what it is uh, we believe about God and why we believe it. So this uh, series is called Knowing God, and we're just going to have an introduction to it um, this morning. Our uh, sermon text, though, comes from Psalm chapter 8. And it says, For the director of music, according to Giddeth, a psalm of David. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind? that you are mindful of them and human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word now, I pray you'd give us help by your spirit to understand the things that you've said so that we can know you truly. Would you plow the fields of our stony hearts right now so that as your word is planted, it can bear fruit in our life. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to be considering who God is and how uh, to know God. It might seem like a simple endeavor to you, kind of matter of fact, but have you forgotten how hard it can be to get to know somebody? Some people choose to close themselves up, and you might know them for for years and not really know them because they just won't open up to you. To get them to say anything is is like pulling teeth. But in knowing God, uh, we experience that problem, but we experience it inverted. God is not the one who's closed up. We are. We've closed ourselves up from God in multiple ways. Ever since he has spoken uh, and created mankind, he's spoken to us and and revealed who he is, but we have closed ourselves up in all sorts of ways, either uh, by refusing to acknowledge his existence at all or his presence in our life, or another way we close ourselves off from God is insisting Um, on believing in our own version of him and not letting him speak for himself. This is why it's so difficult to know God. And this is why there are so many different ideas about who God is. But we can know God. We really can. Because he has made himself known through his word. And that's the main idea for the sermon. That's also kind of the main idea for the whole series. We can know God because he's made himself known through his word. The question is, are we going to humble ourselves before him? Are we going to receive him for who he is and surrender our assumptions? Well, let's look at two ways that we close ourselves up from God and then see how God breaks through those barriers to make himself known. For some of us close ourselves off from God by refusing to acknowledge his existence. We'll say things like, who can know God? No one really can. No one can know God truly, even if he were to exist. Or we can even believe in God's existence, but we can just practically live as if he didn't exist. But every day, despite our ignorance, and, 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 and um, refusal to accept him. We are confronted with the fact that he does exist th- and that he has created us, each one of us, 
to know him. Here's five brief examples of how God confronts every person with his existence. This will go quick. I can email this out to you if you want. Sorry, it's going to be a lot of information. But first, God confronts us with his existence just in the fact of um, we have morality within us. Here's an argument for morality. C.S. Lewis called this the great ought. The feeling that we ought to do the right thing. It reflects a universal moral law transcendent over all people groups in all times of history, compelling all people that they ought to do something. Why is this? Let's suggest the evidence that all of these people who all feel this great ought were created by the same God who happens to be righteous and just. Romans 2, 14 and 15 says that the requirements of God's law are written on our hearts and our own consciences bear witness to this. Second, there's an argument from just the nature of worship itself. You could call it an argument from consent. And what what I mean by that is the presence of religion, although it's expressed in many different ways, the presence of religion itself across the scope of unrelated groups of people and cultures throughout history suggests what? Perhaps it suggests the evidence that we were made by a transcendent God over all creation who created us in order to worship and in order to worship him. So we see in Isaiah 43, the Lord says, bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11 says that God has placed eternity in the human heart. Third, here's an argument from creation. It's also known as the cosmological argument. The existence of a caused universe, by the way, everyone says the universe was caused, atheists and Christians. The universe was caused and that time had a beginning. That's not debated. Everyone, everyone believes caused universe, beginning of time. But according to all of our laws of science, that actually requires an uncaused force to have created such a world. This suggests the evidence, perhaps, that we were created by an uncaused, eternal God who is outside of time. Isaiah 40. Lift up your eyes and just look to the heavens. Who created all this? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each by name. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4 says, Every house is built by someone. So God is the builder of everything. Fourth, an argument from design. This is also known as the teleological argument. Now, in light of the law of entropy, which says that everything is breaking down, we, as human beings, confess it is impossible for chaos to produce order and design. And yet, all of creation, especially you, as a human being, you're filled with intricacy. Inc- intricacy, and design. And on top of that, the intricacy and design uh, that we see in the universe and in ourselves works towards a purpose. Imagine that. How does it work toward a functional purpose? This suggests, perhaps, the evidence that we were created by an intelligent and purposeful God. Psalm 149, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am not randomly and chaotically combusted, but fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Fifth, an argument from necessity, or you could say contingency. The chances, the statistical chances, that life evolved and survived billions of years of evolutionary processes without guidance, that's the key, without guidance is incalculable. And on top of that, the idea that any amount of energy, any amount of energy could produce life and consciousness is unfounded. Perhaps this suggests the evidence that we were created by a conscious and life-giving God. Genesis 1, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. 
And God said, let there be, and there was. Genesis 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Well, there are many arguments for God's existence which breaks through our ignorance. That there is an eternal, omniscient, omnipotent, and personal God who created each one of us. And they continue to accumulate the more we stack them up in what we see and experience in creation. But you and I do not need to prove the existence of God. He has done so himself. For he created us after his own image. He made his power plain to all of us in creation. He's revealed his own holiness and law in every person's conscience, and he's placed eternity in our hearts. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So if you find yourself um, resisting, acknowledging God's existence or presence as your creator, hear this appeal. Consider God's kindness in giving you your breath and your life and your everything. Don't you know his kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? This is not a time for playing philosophical games in an attempt to justify your self-autonomy. There is a day when every person will stand before this living God to give an account for themselves. And no one who refuses to acknowledge his existence and rightful claim over their life will have an excuse to give. Today is the day of humbly receiving his mercy, which he has offered through Christ Jesus, who is God incarnate. God made man, sent to reconcile man back to himself. And Christ did this, being sent by the Father, by living a perfectly obedient life and dying a sacrificial death in our place with the promise that all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Today, if you would only hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. After all, do you really think it's just a coincidence you're here today? It's not. And yet, it's not just about today either, but yesterday and last month and five years ago and the moment you were born The God who created you has been after you this whole time. Would you come to him? Would you know this God? Well, here's a second way that we close ourselves off from God. Perhaps this is more of you uh, than the first. We assume God exists, yet insist in believing in our own version of who we would like him to be. We say things like, I know all about God. But don't you know that two people can argue about the existence of God and both be fools? The first fool says, there is no God. The second fool says, I know all about him. There so too is a God. Perhaps you should slow down and pause before you go any further. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, guard your steps. When you go to the house of God, go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven. You are on earth. So let let our words be few. A few nights ago, I was laying in bed with uh, my son getting ready Uh, to go to sleep, and reading a few stories. And after the first book, I put down, and and I went to pick up the second book, and he didn't want that book. He said, no, read Apple Book. I'm thinking, what is Apple Book? He pulls out a little pamphlet he stole from church (laughs) with a little apple on it. And I took it and opened it up, um, and it was written in another language. And I looked at it and stared and wondered, what what could this be about? But do you know how ridiculous that was for 
for me to think? How long would I have to lay there in bed until I could find any information in a language I don't know? How much more so for human beings to know anything about a transcendent, eternal God? How long would we have to look at him before we got anywhere? In presuming that we know all about God, we are like those in Genesis chapter 11 who believe they could get to him by building a tower if it were only tall enough. The folly of those at the Tower of Babel is like an illustration for those who believe their human ability can climb up and know the mind of God. Isaiah 40. Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct him as his counselor? No one can. No one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Romans 11. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. John Calvin, one of the most uh, prolific and well-spoken theologians of history said, they are mad who seek to discover what God is. And this is why. On the one hand, everyone knows God, yet he remains a mystery to the wisest among us. So where does that leave us? How can we know God? Well, it leaves us dependent on God revealing himself to us. After all, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit that's in them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And what we have received is the spirit who is from God so that we might understand what God has freely given to us. We can suppose to know many things about God, but of course we will never get any confidence and will always be up for debate unless God tells us a thing or two about who he is. And yet what good would it be for an infinite and transcendent God to reveal himself to finite, simple creatures as us? And so God has done us one better. He has described what he is like in many ways and in ways that we can actually understand. Theologians use a term called accommodation. God has accommodated his divine transcendence to our human capacities so that although we can never know him fully, we can know him truly. Now, there are many ways that God accommodates himself to us so that we can understand what he is like. For example, when you're reading scripture, you'll, you'll see many different names of God. Why does he give us so many names? Not because he has so many, but because each of them are telling us something about what he is like. You see how God relates to human beings. He talks about himself as a father. We see the son, the spirit. Those are actually accommodations. So we learn something about who, what he's like. He's a gardener. He's a warrior. Those are all accommodations. But let me look at um, two in detail. First, God accommodates to us by speaking about his attributes in terms of some of our own human attributes. For example, God is good. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is just. God is holy. Well, let me break some news to you. God is not any of those things in the way that we are. He is all of those things, but he is the perfection of all of those qualities. And in terms of our goodness and justice and mercy and all that, he's in a different league altogether. Um, um, it's, it's not as if uh, some people have, for example, two points of kindness. Other really good people have, have ten points of kindness, but God has a hundred points of kindness. And it's just a matter of quantity that's different between us and God. No. That's actually, if you believe that, you're closer to a Greek mythological view of God than a Christian view of God. As they believe, that's why they believed a, a, per, a man could achieve godhood because only it was just a matter of uh, quantity. No, the difference is quality. God is qualitatively different than us in every way. So it's not like the difference between a smaller, weaker airplane and a larger, more powerful airplane. A qualitative difference would be like a paper airplane that's floating in the wind and a metal airplane that is powered by electricity. 
God is qualitatively different than human beings and distinct from his creation in every way. A second way God accommodates to us is by speaking to us of his character in human terms. For example, you'll read of God having eyes and a face and a back and a hand and a nose, even feathers. Psalm 91 verse 4, God has feathers. Does God really have any of those things? No, he doesn't. For God is spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 1, no one has seen God. For, as the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians, he is the invisible God of whom Christ is the image. So when anyone in Scripture says that they have seen the Lord, they may be speaking truly, but what they have seen is not God as he is in himself, but they've seen God as he has accommodated himself in order to be seen. God makes himself findable. It's like when I play hide-and-seek with my son. If I wanted to, I could win every time. Simple. When he starts to count, I go outside, and I get in my car, and I drive away. (laughs) He cannot beat me. But is that what any parent does? No. They make themselves findable. They go in the corner, and they put a little blanket over them and leave their toe sticking out. That's what God has done for us in speaking to us in ways we can understand. Accommodating his divine transcendence to our human capacities. God has not revealed who he is, but what he is like. And why? Why speak to us this way? Why speak through analogies? Why not just give it to us straight? Well, the fact is he can only use analogies if we are going to understand anything. Because who he is transcends our human capacities to understand. Why speak to us through analogies? He's too wonderful. My favorite theologian, Herman Bavink, 19th century Dutch, Dutch man, writes this. If God were to speak to us in divine language, not a creature would understand him. But what spells out his grace, he says, is the fact that from the moment of creation, God stoops down to his creatures, speaking and appearing to them in human fashion. And why does God use so many analogies? Why why such a plethora of analogies through and through Scripture? It seems it's it's never-ending. Well, not only is God too wonderful for humans to fathom, he's too wonderful to be described. In order order for us to ascribe him whatever kind of glory we are capable of, he must be described in all sorts of ways. As St. Augustine said, "You you try to speak of him in some way, you find that he is everything. No one knows all about God except God. And in fact, if we were to ever begin to learn something about God, get comfortable. Because the beginning stage will extend through eternity. We cannot know God fully, but we can know him truly. As he accommodates to our finite capacities in Scripture through analogies, like an adult would speak simply to a child or a translator would speak in a foreigner's mother tongue. So let us not be presumptuous of our knowledge of God and our ability to know him. Let us remain rather curious of what he has to say. I mean, how do you feel when you have a thought you want to share with somebody and they cut you off because they think they know what you're going to say? Don't treat God that way. Do not sit at his table ready to talk. Be quick to listen. God is not a doctrine. He is a person. You and I cannot change him, and no matter what we would prefer to believe about him, he already exists as he is. This is no greater illustrated than the proper name he has given us to know him by, Yahweh, meaning I am who I am. Sorry. I believe many of us are led astray in actually knowing God because we are not looking for him. We may be looking 
but we're not interested in believing that God is already there. He's already put together completely without our input. And we know that this is us when we say things like, I like to think of God as fill in the blank. Or, I refuse to believe in a God who would fill in the blank. Or, well, God loves everyone, therefore, and we fill in the blank for God as if he hasn't already done so. The only authorized information about God is his own self-revelation. So what we ought to say to ourselves is, I refuse to believe in a God of my own imagination. Therefore, I will wholly seek him as he has revealed himself to me through his word. And particularly in the person and work of Jesus Christ. I will consider the whole counsel of God in knowing God rather than cropping out parts that I don't prefer. Jeremiah 29 verse 13. You will seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. I think the operative word there is me. When you seek me. This means that There's somebody that's already there, and it's him we are searching for. Therefore, we have to search for God without any part of our heart desiring him to be any sort of way. Lest we deceive ourselves, thinking we've found him, all the while fiddling with an idol. But let us conclude now, considering just a little bit more deeply what I've been talking about this whole time, something quite profound Yet because it's right under our noses, you might have missed it. Can't you see how loving of a thing this is for him to do for us? I mean, imagine you're sitting alone at a cafe. And you overhear a conversation of people talking in in another language. You not only feel left out because you're alone, you feel left out because you're not part of a conversation. You can't understand it. But then they notice you. They see you're alone. So they invite you over to their table. But then they go on speaking in their foreign language. You still feel left out, don't you? So in an even greater display of kindness, they switch to speak your language so that you can be brought into the conversation. This is what God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit have done for us human beings. He has invited us to sit with him to know him, and he has made himself knowable so that we can talk. Though God in himself is unfathomable, he has come down to our level, and he gives us a few things to fathom in ways that we can understand. And these things are not only sufficient for us to truly know him, the things that he gives us to fathom melt our hearts in fear and reverence and sweep us up in joyful praise all at the same time. Well, I've told the members of the church at least once before of one of my favorite professors from seminary, Dr. Dennis Johnson. He was a a legend, really, not only for his theological proficiency, but for his pastoral sensibilities that were combined with it. He received a Ph.D. in New Testament studies and then went on to lecture at a graduate school for over 30 years, half of the time in the New Testament department, the other half of the time in the pastoral studies department. And for all his knowledge and experience, he listened to us humbly with our little questions as if he hadn't heard them a thousand times before. So needless to say, I, wanting to be a pastor like him, really admired him. I really admired this man and wanted to be like him in so many ways. So I listened to him as much as I could. I took all of his classes. But he retired after my very first year. I only had three courses with him. A few years later, as I was a much more experienced student and I was eyeing the graduation stage, I see his name on the roster. He was coming back to teach an elective for the winter. So we were all so excited to see Dr. Johnson again and take another class, even if it was just for a month. Now, as the winter term was approaching, I went to the library. I parked my car and I went around the building and I almost bumped into him. And he stopped and looked at me and and then began to smile and said, Ethan, 
And, and I didn't know what to say. I had no idea he would remember my name. I mean, why would he? Decades of teaching, thousands of students. He remembers my name. And to think that he's off somewhere right now, admired and honored by theologians, he knows my name. What we have been seeing this whole time is that God, our infinite, transcendent creator, whose voice creates what it says, whose wisdom confounds the wise, whose power guides and directs everything which comes to pass, whose presence takes up every place in himself, whose goodness restores things far beyond their former glory and whose faithfulness is unchanging, never-ending. This God knows you. He knows you by name. He knows each of your names here. We can know God, sure, sure, but that God knows me, now that is something. Back to our text, Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You say your glory in the heavens. And when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, pff, what, what is mankind that you are mindful of us? What is man that you care for us? Even the apostle Paul catches himself as he's writing to the churches of Galatia. He says, now that you've come to know God, or rather to be known by God, and this reality that God knows me caused Philip, the disciple, to realize Jesus was divine. Philip told Nathaniel, come with me to meet Jesus. And when Jesus saw Nathaniel, John chapter 1, approaching, he said, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel was taken aback. He said, how do you know me? Jesus answered, before Philip called you, I saw you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me. I chose you. And then the apostle Paul applies this to the church in Ephesians chapter 1. God chose us in Christ before the creation of the world to be home, holy and blameless in his sight. I'll close with this quote from J.I. Packer in his classic book, Knowing God, highly commend it. Packer writes this, What matters supremely, therefore, is not the fact that I know God, but that larger fact which underlies it, the fact that he knows me. I am graven on the palm of his hands. I am never out of his mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me, and I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me. And there's no moment when his eye is off me or his attention distracted from me. And no moment, therefore, when his care falters. That's the end of the quote. So receive this invitation today to know God. Let us see this summer how it is God has actually revealed himself so that we might know him more. And let us praise him for his grace in revealing himself to us at all. Let us be washed over by his love in the fact that he created us to know him. He noticed us from afar. He drew us near by coming to us himself through Christ and by his spirit. Amen. Let's pray. We're going to take a minute just to pray for you to pray personally to God. Is there a way that God has spoken to you today? Is, is there something the sermon made you think about that you need to pray about? How's God calling you to respond to him today?